All right, so guys, we're here joined with a special edition of the Sit Down with Malik Wright presented by First Star Logistics. I promise that this week I'll be going live talking all things Bengals with Bengals fans. And first person up is my man, Chris, man, my man, Chris Smith. Chris, and I quote, I got to read off the tweet that you sent me, man. You said, been a fan since day one, and I appreciate you supporting too, brother. You said, completely disagree with your point of view regarding the defensive tackle over an offensive tackle. And I have the history to back it up. We'll love to come on and have a discussion. So, Chris, I appreciate you, number one, for being a supporter, man. I appreciate you for interacting with, with me, man, and uh, supporting the show, man, and, um, you know, even joining me today and taking the time out of your day to discuss uh, what you had on my, and you're on your mind, and so to speak, about my opinions about the NFL draft and just the Bengals in general. But, my man, the floor is yours. You said you came with the facts. You said you came with the stats. So, this is the part where I shut up and I let you talk. So floor is yours, my man. man. Well, let's just look at history. You know, let's look at history when it comes to the Bengals drafting an offensive tackle in the first round and mm -hmm. compare it to what they've done with offensive tackles in the later rounds. Mm -hmm. You know, certain teams have specialties, right, as far mm -hmm. as the drafts. The Cowboys are known to draft offensive linemen. The Bengals are known to draft wide receivers and mm -hmm. defensive backs. That has been our specialty. Offensive line has not been our specialty in drafting. If you just look at the previous years, even though Cedric Abway was the first round, he was a late first round. Terrible pick, by the way. Terrible. Jake Fisher, later. What was that? A second round pick as well. Mm -hmm. The only person that has been able to contribute as a tackle has been Andrew Woodworth, right? And he was drafted as a guard. And it took, what, four or five years for him to convert to tackle? Mm -hmm. So if you just look at history, the history says when we draft the first round tackle, now everybody's going to point to Jonah Williams. Jonah Williams was a four or five year starter. You know, you, you, you can't ask for better. Now, did he live up to the level of play that we thought? Maybe not, but a four or five year tackle and he got a multi-year deal this past off season. So mm -hmm. you can't really say that he was a bust. You look at Andre Smith. Andre Smith was another four or five year tackle. Can't say that he was a bust either. He had productive years here. Can't say he was a bust. He had productive years. Was he, did he live up to the potential? No. He did it, but I wouldn't classify him as a bust. Uh, so when you look at all of these different, Levi Jones, was he a first round pick? Going back to the Bengals? Wait, say that again? Was who? Levi, Levi Jones. Uh, was he a first round pick for the Levi Bengals? Levi Jones. I'm not sure if he was or not. I, let, me, let me pull that up and see. Yeah, let's pull that up. I have my, my, I have my, my producer pull that up. The, Levi the, Jones, Marissa. If we look at the history of the Bengals, when we can just look at the talent, right, without he evaluating was, it as a project mm -hmm. or as a something that we had to kind of put away and stash and try to develop, that's when we kind of run into issues. Go for the talent and then just let them play and let the talent speak for itself. And mm -hmm. that's where we don't run into issues. So to me, I think if there's any year to go offensive tackle, this is the year. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue stems from us not taking a tackle last year. You know, everybody want to point to DeWan Jones, and yes, the league did pass on him three times, but he was still there in the later rounds, and we chose to pass on him knowing that we had Jonah Williams coming up, and we everyone knew that he wasn't going to resign. You, choose, you chose not to drive the tackle, Mm -hmm. We chose to pass up on DeWan Jones. And what happened? You had that same issue creep back around to this year. And by you passing on the tackle now, guess what? There's no guarantee that it's going to be there in round two or three. And I've seen all the mocks. Patrick Paul is going to move up. You know, Blake Fisher is going to move up. Because you know what's going to occur is teams are going to look at these tackles and see if they can convert to guards. So you're going to have teams who will, need, who will need a guard and a tackle go after a Blake Fisher or a Patrick Paul or a Rosen Garden. So those tackles may not be there. And then also, do you want to pigeonhole your, pitch your yourself again 
as far as taking that need because you're doing the same thing that you don't want to do in the first round right you don't you, you want to take that bpa instead of the need but if you find yourself you can find yourself in the second round doing the exact same thing taking the need over the bpa but you're mm -hmm. going to be taking a lesser player than what you would have gotten in the first round so mm -hmm. i've seen all the different mocks that you guys have had and i've you ran into the same issue every time in that second round. You guys overlooked the BPA and took that tackle because of you having to take that knee to that defensive tackle. But the one thing that I've also found is that there's defensive tackles there in that second round. And as we've known throughout history, the Bengals have taken good defensive tackles in the later rounds. So, we don't need to jump in on a Jerzon Newton or a Byron Murphy. My most important asset is number nine. So I would rather stockpile offensive linemen to keep number nine upright than have a defensive line because I guarantee, and I, I follow everybody online. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to Zim. He put me in his spaces because I was going back and forth with him as well. And I feel like the, the the discourse of conversation is about defense in the off season, but mm -hmm. come in season, it's going to be about the offense and what can the offense do. So what do we need to do? We need to establish what type of team are we, right? Are we an offensive team or are we a defensive team? Mm -hmm. If you look at the Chiefs, the Chiefs was an offensive identity team. If you look back at that Buffalo game versus uh uh, the Chiefs in the playoffs, they put up 40, right? It was 30 or 40 points quickly. Mm -hmm. Now they can barely get over 20. They acknowledged that they were not that same team and they chose to go to the defensive route. Us as the Bengals, we need to identify, are we going to be an offensive team or are we going to be a defensive team? The last two years, we went defense in the first three rounds and we still had the last ranked defense total yards, right? So we need to identify, do we want to be this offensive juggernaut or a defensive team? And I think we need to we need to bank everything on that offense because that defense is, I don't see it being a top 10 team with the Jerzon Newton or with the Byron Murphy going into next year. I see it at best being maybe a 15th to 20th rank in total defense. Hmm. So we need to put everything into that offense and outscore and use your offense as your defense. Mm. Build leads, right? Run the ball from that once you maintain that lead. And I think that's the one thing that we're kind of getting away with right now. Chris, I appreciate everything you just said, my man. And I understand the the path that you're taking. You're all in on the offense, offensive-driven league, offensive-driven team. So let's do everything we can to make the offense uh, unstoppable force. I understand your angle. What if I told you, though, the defense, the issues that they were plagued with last year, a lot of it came down to communication. You see, in a Luana Ramos defense, the safety really does control a lot of the communication aspect. And they had issues there last year. It's the reason why they went heavy as they did on safety and the free agency. So you couple that with the fact that the biggest issue the Bengals see is their lack of a pass rush consistently. The DJ reader loss is huge. Don't get me wrong. It's massive. But what we're talking about here is the inability to effectively rush the passer and get pressure on the quarterback, you know, consistently. And it, you start to see, Guys like Trey Hendrickson playing astronomical amount of snaps. DJ Reader was playing a high number of uh, snaps, and he's not even necessarily a pass rusher. He's a, a standard nose tackle. And since Geno Atkins left out of here, the team has been trying. They've been vying to replace him. They've been trying to do that, and they have not been able to find a suitable replacement. They found guys that are able to fill in to the role, but no mainstay at, at the position. You can look at the offensive tackle. They've tried to address throughout the years, whether it be Lyle Collins, right? Whether it be now they're going out there, they have Trent Brown here. 
whether it be allocating draft picks towards the tackle position. The one thing we don't want to lose sight of is you also can't reach at a tackle spot just because a tackle's there. Because here's the one thing, if I'm the Bengals, that I'm looking at. I'm looking at the fifth-year option. That said tackle that we draft, right, the whole – one of the most lucrative spots of drafting a guy in the first round is you typically have that player for five years. You have control of that player for five years. You have the four years and you have the fifth year option, which the team has the ability to enact or, uh, or not more times than not teams invoke the fifth year option for said player. Well, if you draft an offensive tackle to be the offensive tackle of the future, you're already throwing away one year. Let's start there. You're already way throwing, you're throwing away one year because as much as we'd like for them to, we'd like to say the Bengals are going to put the best guys out there, the best five guys out there. We know they're not. We know that they're going to say Cordell Volson, you're the starting left guard unless they draft a guard this year to compete. They're not going to take said tackle and say, hey, say said tackle that we drafted in the first round, you're going to go steal the job from Cordell Volson. That makes sense. It does. It would make sense if that guy was to able to come in Challenge for the left guard spot because he's going to be the right tackle of the future. And then we had that situation sorted out, but we have to deal in the world of Bengals. Meaning, if they draft a tackle in the first round, that Ted said tackle is probably going to sit a year, fifth year option thrown down the drain. So essentially, you now have four years of said play. I disagree. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's, let's first off talk about Trent Brown. And sure. This is one of the things I was saying last week. I think we are drastically overvaluing mm. Brown. Mm -hmm. The league will tell you if a player is wanted or not. How many visits did Trent Brown have this offseason? How many offers did he have out there? There were teams interested, for sure. They were interested. They couldn't match $2 million? No, it's not. So, so, four, so here's the four million you know, I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish. Sorry. To play 17 games for one year. Like to me, I feel like that's backup money. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a six man coming off the bench money. He's not even getting paid nowhere near what Lyle Collins was making the year before that. You know, what if fact, Lyle Collins came back after missing the last year mm -hmm. and he's making just about the same amount as Trent Brown is making right now this year. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I think we're putting our eggs in a basket on a guy that has a vet, damn near a vet minimum contract. Why can't we say that we draft a player in the first round and he goes out there and competes with Trent Brown for that starting left or starting right tackle spot? Why are we penciling a $2 million vet who has hasn't really played a full season who came mm -hmm. from a run based offense right so I, I get i get it everybody's looking at the pft stats right or the pff stats and they're seeing oh my god he's 70 something and pff oh man like i looked at jonah williams and he was like 50 you know so he's obviously a better player but he's also we're we're, we're talking about jonah williams who dropped back about 30 plus times a game mm -hmm. and where Trent Brown went forward about 30 times a game. So there's mm -hmm. a, a little bit of the, the difference between the two, but I think it's, we're, we're just slightly, not even slightly, we're very much overvaluing what Trent Brown is and what the mm -hmm. rest of the league think he is. So what if I told you Trent Brown is one of the best right tackles in football? Uh, I would say he had a good year last year. Uh, no, not just not just last year. Offense. Not just last year. I'm talking about over the course of his career, he has been one of the best right tackles in football. When now, let, 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 me, let me go a step further. Trent Brown has a bad rap. Let me tell you why he has a bad rap. Trent Brown was coveted as one of the best tackles, one of the best tackles in football, which is why he... he secured the contract he did with the Raiders. The Raiders were an absolute mm -hmm. mess, right? There was no accountability. There were questions about the leadership uh, of uh, who was in charge there at the time. 
it was a it was a complete colossal mess. Let's just call it what it was. He went back to New England, restored his value. Then things went haywire, where the entire offense, not just Trent Brown, there were other players on that team, some people I've talked to, who genuinely did not understand what Bill Belichick's philosophy was or what it is he was trying to do, you know, with the offense. This is a guy, Trent Brown, who was routinely the best offensive lineman when healthy that the Patriots had outside of Michael Alina. Consistently. And he's blocking for guys who have no footwork in the pocket, have no ability to move, and he's doing his damn. They ask him to play right tackle. He plays right tackle. They ask him to play left tackle. He plays left tackle. No questions asked. Yeah. He's blocking for Bailey Zappi one week, then Mac Jones one week, then Cam Newton one week. Like It's an interchangeable thing at the quarterback position in New England. There was no bit of consistency. Offensive line, a lot like wide receivers, a lot like quarterbacks, they need to be able to have some type of consistency with their quarterback. Right. With the people that they're playing next to, with the cadence that they're hearing. Trent Brown did that admirably. I will say that. One thing where I issue where I feel like he did struggle was the ability, the, uh, the availability at times with the Patriots. But I actually don't think it was quote-unquote injuries. I genuinely think... Trent Brown didn't want to play for the Patriots. The last there were there were games, a couple games this year where the Patriots just didn't suit him up. That he was on inactively because him and Bill Belichick weren't seeing eye to eye for whatever reason that is. I don't buy the story that Trent Brown is unable to stay healthy because I've seen a motivated Trent Brown. I've seen a Trent Brown that is able to be out there. And no, I'm not saying that he answers all the questions for the future for Cincinnati. That is not what I'm saying. But I think that what Cincinnati was able to get, they was able to get one of the premier right tackles in our league. You could put him wherever you want to at a bargain bin price. And he allows you to open up the draft for yourself. So that way, if there is a premium talent on the defensive line, maybe you can get that said defensive tackle player that you've been vying for since Geno Atkins are placed. Maybe if you go out there, you grab that defensive tackle that you believe is a difference maker, you won't feel that to sign three different different defensive tackles. There wouldn't be such a um, focal point put on the nose tackle position because DJ Reader is the last of a dying breed. There isn't a lot of quote-unquote true nose tackles in football anymore. Usually they want guys that have the pass rushing upside and have the ability to stop the run. DJ Reader was just really, really elite at stopping the run and holding his point of attack. Well, yeah. So you you got two guys in Byron Murphy and Jerzon Newton in the draft. I think Jerzon Newton has a higher upside in terms of pass rushing right off the bat. I think Byron Murphy is the player with the higher ceiling, if you ask me, where I think he's going to be great in the run and great in the pass. I think Derzon Newton is good in the run as well, but I just think that Byron Murphy has the ability to truly be a game wrecker and just change the game for years to come and be one of the best defensive players, which is why he's rated so highly and which is why he tests like an absolute freak. So for me, it's like I want that position secured because guess what? You can scheme for guys rushing off the edge. It's very hard to scheme for a guy wrecking the middle of your defense, like wrecking the middle of your offensive line time and time again. It's the reason why Aaron Donald was such a problem for so many years. The reason why the, the you know the Rams won so many games, they had no business winning for so many years when they had a guy like Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald single-handedly changed the Bengals' Super Bowl trajectory. You know what I'm saying? So I understand where you're coming from. Only thing I'll caution with you, my man, is there are some players, hear me out, there are some players in the later rounds that I do think um, could be very, very good for this offensive line. Really good for this offensive line. One of my favorite guys. You know what? You, you, you're about to say something. Go ahead. That goes back to my, I feel like it was an open monologue, but mm -hmm. um, where I talked about our evaluation of tackles in the later rounds. We yeah. don't have that eye, right? That is not one of our team's strengths. Now, you, as an, a person that looks around the league and knows the league, you may be able to spot that talent, but will the front office spot mm -hmm. that talent when it comes up? Will they take that? Because if you look back, and this is no disrespect to the Jackson Carmen. He, I, I, live, I live in Fairfield. He's from Fairfield. You know, his mom was a piano lady at my wife's church. So um, there's history there. But yeah. he wasn't the proper pick at that time that we chose him, right? You had different, you had, it was similar to the same situation, actually. 
You had Cosme there. You had Lander Dick, Lander Dickinson, I believe, was there. And we chose to take a guy that was probably going to be there in a third round. And then once we got him, right, what did we do? He was a left tackle. He didn't really have history playing right tackle or guard. We turned him into a right guard, right? Mm -hmm. Then the following year, we turned him into a right tackle, right? So that's what I – we need to find that right tackle not the left tackle that we need to convert to the right tackle but that that right tackle like a mims right or a latham or um i'm not going to say fatana but i would say mims and latham between the two of them and it's just based upon i'm looking at it from a Bengals point of view now if we were the cowboys right everything mm -hmm. that you're saying would make sense because they have a history of finding offensive talent in the later rounds. Mm -hmm. We do not have that history as a team. And it's okay to look at yourself in the mirror and say, that's not one of our strengths. So you know what I'm gonna do to, to kind of uh, eliminate that weakness? I'm gonna go after the best talent available, right? That talent, is going to put me over as far as me having to evaluate talent that isn't up to par, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what is going to occur. And that there's a huge drop off in that second round, right? And, and going forth in the, in the third round, I, I think a lot of those players that we feel that's going to be there, they're not going to be there. The Blake that's and that's possible, right? That's possible. But, but then, there's a guy, there's a guy mm -hmm. that I do think has a bright future in the National Football League. Who is a true right tackle who has dom been dominant at the position his name is blake fisher offensive tackle out of notre dame i like him he's a guy you let my co-host on state of the jungle tell it they probably wouldn't feel comfortable drafting that guy at 49. me, me i i am always of the belief that if you love a player like, obviously, it depends how the board shapes up. I think other talent on the board for you to go there. And maybe there'll be a guy that you get in third. Maybe he'll be there in the third round. And I think that's why having two third-round picks come come into play. Because you can you can move up, right, and get back into the second round. Maybe with a third or a fifth, third and fifth or third and fourth or whatever the case may be. If you don't feel like that offensive tackle, like a Blake Fisher, might make it to uh, your spot in uh, round three. Blake Fisher is one of the better offensive tackles that I still think will be on the board in the later rounds. Yeah. I just think that you're not the drop off between, you know, a Blake Fisher or who you want to, who, who you'd be drafting to be your right tackle of the future versus the, some of the defensive tackles is drastic. I'm not as high on some of these other defensive tackles. People are high on for you me. Like when I look at, defensive tackle? Huh? You don't like the Duke and the LSU defensive tackle? Uh, the, uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I know people are high on them. I I personally am extremely high on the Jerzon Newton, Byron Murphy, uh, one of those two, because I think those are the two of the last of the Mohegans, for, so to speak, that I think can change the front of your defense. I, I would love for a Byron Murphy to be there, right? I would love for uh, um, Jerzon Newton to be there. To me, I just think that what you're getting out of those two, you're getting five years of premium, uh, you know, uh, you're getting five years out of a premium position, and you're getting – a guy that you can truly build around. He's a guy that you could say is your own draft pick that you drafted. Sheldon Rink is on a two-year deal. It might look like, oh, two years, but it's not that long. BJ Hill's a free agent after this year. You two know what I mean? There's more than the Trent Brown deal. This is true. But here's the beautiful thing about that. Here's the beautiful thing about that, right? Trent Brown signed here on a one-year deal. He signed here on a one-year deal. You can still there are other there are other rounds where you can luckily the NFL draft isn't just one or two rounds. There's other times where you can sort of pick somebody up draft somebody that will fit that mold that you're looking for the tackle position but then you also still have next year to roll around with is what was my thought process is for me there's going to be some people coming off the books probably after next year maybe like a t higgins maybe like a bj hill so where you can allocate more resources obviously to that position if there is a set tackle that you love maybe trent brown has a great year shocks us all and then you're like maybe i want to keep that guy in the fold i have no idea that's not ideal you you want to have somebody there for the long term all i'm saying there man is i think what you'd be getting out of a jerzon newton or byron murphy would be game changing absolutely game changing if there's a if a tackle falls that you like that you love 
right? To me, I think Amarius Mims has a lot of question marks with him. I understand one of my favorite, one of my, my, not my favorite words, one of the words I hate hearing, Chris, is potential. I hate that right. or intangible. I hate that. And that's the word that comes up every single time you discuss Amarius Mims. Oh, potential and tangibles because we saw it for seven games. That's not enough for me to draft the guy with the 18th overall pick. A lot of question marks, especially with the health concerns. Then you look at a guy like J.C. Latham. I don't see what everybody else sees with J.C. Latham, and I'm a University of Alabama Crimson Tide fan. I saw inconsistency. I saw poor, poor footwork at times. And I feel like, again, we're getting caught up a lot from the school he went to and just you know uh, him testing well. I, I think that we have to look at it and we have to say to ourselves, all right, Number one, will J.C. Latham even be there? I'm not even sure, right? But it, do you love the prospect? And it, you have to ask yourself at that point, do you love J.C. Latham over a Byron Murphy, over a Jerzon Newton? I'm not in the Bengals front office, but I can tell you I can answer that question for myself. I can say, no, I don't. Can I answer your question? Yes, sir. What do you feel better at right now? Right now, mm -hmm. going into the draft, do you yeah. feel better at your defensive tackle spot or your right tackle spot? Because I, I feel, feel better, better at my, my right tackle spot, spot than my defense than my defensive tackle spot right now. I do. I have I have two guys on my defensive on my three tech spot right now that got me mm -hmm. six sacks last year. Two Say three techs. BJ Hill has six sacks last year. Sure. Right? As a three tech. Shannon yep. Rankins had six sacks last year as a three tech. Mm -hmm. So where where you lost that run ability of DJ Reader, guess what? You got better on the pass rushing. Right. So I actually like our three techs way better than I like my right tackle, because guess what? Now, again, I know you 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 said that Trent Brown may not have, you know, he had issues where he probably just he sat out where he wasn't injured. But I don't like that backup behind Trent Brown. Right. I, then yeah. that's and that's why I put my that three tech oh, that position over that right tackle. Because but I just want to clarify, though. You have two guys that play the same exact position in B.J. Hill and Sheldon Rankins. Sheldon Rankins is the upgrade over B.J. Hill. So right. but when I look at it, down. Byron Murphy, Jerzon Newton paired up with those two because ideally what was said to me, at least I could say, is you know, Sheldon Rankins is brought in to play that Larry Okunjobi role where he is constantly you know, mixing and rotating out with Sheldon Rankins. I don't get any thought that he is there to play alongside B.J. Hill or B.J. Hill is there to play alongside him. So that tells me they understand there is a hole at that other defensive tackle spot. The, whole, the upside is with a Jerzon Newton and Byron Murphy is you, you don't just get that ability to stop the run. You also get the ability to rush the passer. So therefore, you can disguise your defense a lot more with what it is that you're trying to do. So I think that I think we're agreeing more than we're disagreeing. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's a situation in which um, I think that the right tackle spot is always going to be a sore spot looming in the back of our heads. It's very similar to like tight end. People might think, "Oh my God, we got to out a one year deal." Okay, what's the future after that? All right, is that guy going to give us everything that we're looking for? Luckily, I'll keep saying it. I think that this is a deep tackle class, like people talk about. This is a deep tackle class, and. If you really love a guy, and if you think a guy can change the face of your defense, you go out there and you get him, man. You go out there and you get him. I think that Trent Brown gives you the ability to hold off on the right tackle spot if you don't love a guy there for at least the first round. But, Chris, my man, look, look I, I want to thank you so much for, for joining in. This, this was dope. With, what'd you say? This was awesome. Man, I appreciate you for joining in with me, man. I got to meet with a... Several, several other Bengals fans today, brother. But like, man, I appreciate you, man, just for taking the time out of your day to sit with me, man. Uh, you're cool. You're cool as hell, man. And uh, you know, I think regardless of how the draft shapes out, yep. we're all rooting for the Bengals to have a really, really good draft because there's only one goal, and that's to bring a Lombardi Trophy to Cincinnati, man. Absolutely. Whoever we bring in that defensive tackle, hey, I'm rooting all. No more, you know, no more debate. He's here. Hey, let's let's win it. Let's do it, brother. Who day, man? I appreciate right, you, day, bro. Thank yes, you. sir. I'm